Hi, my name is Diego Taccioli. I'm the co-founder of Slice Lab. Join us in this presentation today, covering how we created this concrete coffee table using just three printed parts and all the research behind it. Slice Lab is an experimental design studio. We're gonna cover one main project, which is our delicate density coffee table. We were originally thinking to 3D print the concrete directly, but unfortunately the forms of which we wanted to create were not quite possible yet with the technology that's out there. We decided instead to 3D print the molds and then traditionally pour it to see how finite we can get the concrete. And that is the main goal of this R&D project. We started in Fusion 360, creating a quick little prototype that had a model with all the features we wanted for the final table. This included having sharp edges, organic forms, and a uniting piece at the top. Also, we wanted to make sure that we poured it flat from the top. So we had to create four openings at the bottom of which the concrete was funneled into. All four pieces of the 3D print were coated on the inside with different materials. This way we could understand the best form of which the concrete would be poured and realized, but also to see how fast and how much better we could demold it. We experimented with three different concretes and three different additives to create a slurry that was perfect for us both in detail and overall strength. As I mentioned, we coated the inside of the 3D prints with different types of epoxies, we sanded it. We also even tried a vapor bath, which is basically a smoothing method for PLA as it kind of erodes it. So we didn't paint it on directly, but just the vapor alone was able to smooth it enough for it to have a different outcome. We compared the results both in the finishes as well as the actual mold beforehand. We noticed that the acetone vapor bath created a really flexible material out of the PLA print, but unfortunately it shrunk. And the best we found was the epoxy 3D. When it came to demolding, the sandpaper had the roughest exit. The z epoxy had an interesting snake-like skin that was left over behind, but also created a smooth surface. And both the acetone, which was flexible, was easily demolded as well as the epoxy because of how smooth the finish was. So we realized that the epoxy 3D was the one to go with. Here's the aftermath of the pieces. What we basically gathered was the smoother the surface, the easier it was to demold. Unfortunately, we noticed there were micro cracks within some of the molds that were the most easily taken off. So for that reason, we knew that the following molds were gonna have to be investment molds, which basically means you don't have the ability to take them off. You have to break them off. Overall, we were pretty happy with the consistency of both concretes that we mixed. We were happy with the white concrete, which was the circrete, because it was a little stronger and smoother to the touch. We also started to notice exactly what we were predicting, which is these micro bubbles that created air pockets within the mold were not able to come out. So while the top was smooth, the bottom kind of had a moon-like crater surface. We didn't waste any time to jump back into the Fusion 360 to create another prototype model. This time we made a flat board that kind of looks like a small ironing board and is roughly 24 inches wide. This time there is one main cavity of which you to pour into that funneled down into three different legs and ultimately to a flat surface. Doing this pour allowed us to learn about hydrostatic pressure. We used two different mixtures that both had super plasticizers, which basically is a compound that allows the concrete to flow smoother and have 15% less water, therefore making it stronger. It also was really good for self-leveling concrete without having to add water. Once we poured the concrete, we started to realize that there were immense pressure pockets that we had to alleviate. So we began to test out a theory that we had, which was basically to start drilling in the areas that we thought were about to burst. We weren't able to fix all of the areas, but we were able to actually salvage both concrete tables for the most part. At the bottom left, you can start to see the power of the concrete as it's off gases and the hydrostatic pressure ruptures the 3D print. The main takeaway was to see exactly how detailed and reflective this concrete could actually get without having to do any post-processing work. The epoxy that we coated the inside of the top of the table was so smooth that we were able to demold it and the final look was what you see here. You'll see at the top left, there was an area that was not perfectly coated in the epoxy and you can see the texture of the 3D print. So overall, the ironing board works. Over the next few slides, we're gonna talk about how we use an animation software, which is Maya, to create a freeform shape and later brought it into Fusion 360 to use the generative analysis tool to create the design you see below. This is the final form we landed on before we went into Fusion 360. You can see below the, all the different options we started with creating legs more liquid-like or elastic-like, but we wanted to make sure that it was still structurally possible to create in concrete. Once we brought the design into Fusion 360, we realized that the back leg needed to be split into two parts and the profile of the front pad needed to be reduced significantly. We were also happy with the top surface we created in Maya, so we decided to use a blocking method that you see as the red block there 
to allow the generative design to no longer grow in that direction and keep and retain the green parts that you see, creating something that had three legs instead of two. At the time, concrete was not a material selection you could have in Fusion 360 for generative design. So we had to get around it. We used different things like stone, marble, et cetera, to try to create at the same exact properties that we could with concrete. And it certainly didn't have the lab made materials that we were experimenting with, which I just told you about. So what we did was we basically took the Maya model from that we just showed you and thickened up the parts according to the research we found and all the suggestions. So we made a kind of a dramatically thick model and it was reduced down into what you see now as the final. After making many simulations, we selected three final ones to combine into one, both for structure and the overall design direction. The final is on the left, which you can see is a lot more designed, but very much similar to what we started with in terms of the simulations. We again didn't waste any time to get these three printed. There are nine pieces that comprise this mold. We also added an additional structural grid at the base that would keep the overall mold flat so that we can pour the legs upside down and still keep that level base. We also added micro structures to the overall skin of the 3D prints so that less rupture would happen and they would be evenly distributed as the pressure points were alleviated. Once we mixed the concrete, we funneled it into the main cavity and started to analyze where the pressure pockets were. We began to drill and realized that that external structure that we created on the surface of the mold was really helpful in alleviating and spreading out the pressure. So the drilling was effective. Because of reinforcement veins that we put on the outside of a 3D print, we had to actually burn this thing out. So we channeled our inner pyro to really get in there with the blow torches. The PLA plastic is very strong and very sharp. So if you go to chisel out these pieces, you can cut yourself pretty badly. But also it was just a lot more fun to do it this way. So here's the final piece. Unfortunately, I knocked the back leg when I was flipping the piece and it did break off. But either way, we realized that we had to reinforce this when we went to the full size mock-up, which was next. Our last mock-up before the final was quite interesting. It was not the same type of mold style or strategy. This time we created a plexiglass window of which we could use to analyze how the concrete flowed into the main cavity and into the legs. We also used our drilling method a lot more regularly on this piece as the concrete was a lot more volumetric. We saw some really interesting features at the end and we were overall happy with the result. We did notice that we do need to adjust from here. We need to reinforce the joints so there's no shifting between the molds. And also the surface finish needs to be a lot cleaner. The air pockets on this particular piece were a lot larger than we wanted. So these were the factors that we were going to get into on the final mold. We were finally ready to scale up our design. We made the table five feet long and calculated roughly 250 pounds of wet concrete. We also realized that we needed 23 different pieces to be printed and oriented in certain ways to create the same structure that we knew worked. But to demonstrate that even with the least technology of 3D printing, anyone could make something like this. Here are all the final parts. We decided to assemble these pieces exactly how you see in this video. We realized that the overall central spine was the most important to keep intact. So lining that up at the end was the most important to us. We could always sand or grind down pieces that were slightly shifted along that spine. Again, we needed to funnel all 250 pounds of concrete through the 10 legs and three major openings. The main cavity was filled up very smoothly and super fast because of the vibration table that we put it on. Next step was to get to the pour. We set up the table over a piece of foam for the vibration table to have a little alleviation between the movement we also set up these wooden jigs all around the outside that basically contained the mold within that space and wasn't able to move around. Right after we finished pouring the concrete, we were pretty happy with the result. We thought it was looking pretty good, but we did have our suspicions. This was not at all what we were thinking was going to happen. So we started realizing there were some hot pressure points and bubbles forming. And before we knew it, two minutes later, this thing started rupturing everywhere. All the valves, we had to run around this thing and try to drill as much as possible in the areas of which we could feel. In the end, we salvaged the piece, but we had to do a lot of different stuff to fix it. Once we were ready to remove the concrete from the mold, we first decided to take advantage of the grid system that we used to create a level surface. We flattened off the bottom of the legs and then later grabbed the chisel and mallet to slowly chip away at this thing to finally realize the shape that was exactly what we wanted. As predicted, the top piece fell off super easy. Because of the smooth finish we gave it and the wax floor paste that we put on, it was no problem at all. No chisels necessary for this area. On the left, you'll see the concrete table directly out of this mold. 
You can still see the striations from the 3D print molds, as well as some of the plastic and some shifting that we had to fix using the diamond wet sander. But at the end, we had a really nice finish that looks mirror-like when it's wet. On the left, you'll see the striations I'm talking about at the bottom of the legs. Underneath the surface, you can see the air bubbles we wanted, relatively all the same size, which is exactly what we were looking for. And then the top, of course, was completely smooth and didn't have any abrasions, so we were pretty happy with the result. So here's the final result. And thanks again to Concrete Works for putting together such an awesome team and taking on this experimental project. We definitely could not have done it without the expertise of all these guys here. And here's a dramatic black and white image of it, just so you can see the overall shape. So what's next? And how can we scale this up? This is the Korean Opera House by Toyo Ito, which is one of the most complex buildings ever built. You can see the rebar on the right is so intricate and so time consuming, everything has to be done by hand and measured and cut almost perfectly. This overall shape is so ambitious, but he was able to do it with all the time that he had, of course, a lot of years to finish his project. But this is where we wanted to go next. I think we can 3D print that rebar. I think we can also create a molds that are large enough to make something like this and potentially recyclable instead of having to break it off every time. We also think it's super important to understand that generative design and topology optimization should be a way to guide your design and not necessarily the final result. It should be a recommendation. At the end of the day, the parametric design that comes out of generative and topo optimization is only as good as the inputs that you put within the software. But I think we can combine these two where potentially the lattice-like form you see on the right could act as a rebar, while a generative design you see on the left that has more of a bone and plant-like structure could be what we used to make the molds like we saw earlier in the concrete coffee table. Lastly, our next step and the most important one is to create these molds again for something larger, but having the ability to actually remove them and not break them. So we need to find a better material that is able to take on the heat that concrete creates, as well as the weight and the overall connection points so that we don't have the micro cracks we did in the beginning and able to recreate something like this without having to make them investment molds and waste so much plastic. I think understanding a good lattice system that would be good for the strength of the concrete, because once you get to a certain size, you need to put some kind of reinforcements on the inside. So you can either 3D print these in a carbon infused plastic, or you could use 3D printing directly in metal. Now imagine this table is a large pavilion, 20 feet tall. We could use the 3D printing and topology optimization along with the generative design to design a lattice that has a good flowability of concrete, as well as retaining a good amount of weight and also the strength that is needed for something of that size. We didn't need to for something this small, but I think for the next step, we are very excited to test out what we can do with the internal lattice work. In fact, companies like Branch Technology and Big Rep are starting to create larger scale printers that we could use similar type of applications for. For example, Branch has a green KUKA robot at the top there that creates this freeform lattice directly out of the nozzle. It doesn't need any structure or any type of supports. And also recently, Big Rep has released a type of concrete that is specifically used for concrete molding. So between combining these two languages, I think we can make some pretty wild shapes. We see scale not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity. This is a house that we designed for a competition that could be completely done in the same way. We would of course need to consult engineers and really test out our theories on reinforcing the concrete with the internal rebar lattices, but it certainly is possible. We want to scale up our design to something that looks like this, and we've even been playing with the idea of designing a small pedestrian bridge. If anyone wants to collaborate with us, please drop us a line at info at slicelab.com. Thank you for joining me. Stick around for the Q&A session coming right up after this. Also, check out our website at slicelab.com. You can also find us on social at slicelab, one word. Thanks again.